Now, there is a third type that is called an estate at will. And if you guys remember what at will means, at will means whenever, whenever. So typically, this is does not have a structured beginning date, nor does it have a structured end date. It literally could start today and end next Thursday or four months from yesterday. It must be there with the consent of the landlord. Once again, this is not the squatter. The landlord has said, yeah, Bob, you can move into my house. It's vacant, so you're, I'm going to uh, let you move in. I know you're having a little bit of trouble at home, blah, 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 whatever story you want to make up, and Bob can move in tomorrow. They don't have to wait to the first of the month or to the middle of the month. It starts whenever. Typically, this is where we get into this oral lease. Now, just because it's oral doesn't mean that the tenant still doesn't have to abide by whatever you agree on. He's still going to have to pay rent. He's still going to have to follow the rules. It's just that it's an indefinite length. It can start whenever and ends whenever. Now, it will end automatically upon the death of either one of the parties. So if the owner dies, that uh, at-will lease will terminate. And that is slightly different than the other two. If the landlord dies and the tenant is on a structured estate for years lease, that lease is still in place. And you hear that term called tenant's rights. You might want to write that down. That term is called tenant's rights, meaning that that tenant will actually get to stay and finish that lease Most states sell property with what's called a tenant's rights, meaning when one landlord sells to the other landlord, if there's a lease in that rental unit, that lease still exists. And the new landlord would take over that lease. So if there's four months still to go on the lease, the new tenant or the, the new landlord or the new owner who just bought it will have to abide by the lease that's currently in place. Now, I say that because there's a little caveat. If the lease actually has a clause in it, there are some states that allow this Indiana will. There is some landlords will say upon the sale of the property, this lease will be terminated. That's fine. You can say that in the contract as long as both parties agree to it. Typically, most landlords don't say anything like that. So it defaults to this thing called tenant's rights, meaning that the lease does not terminate. But in an at will, that lease will automatically terminates. The last one is called an estate at sufferance. At sufferance. This is what is created when that holdover tenant exists. Back to the example. They said they were going to move out on October 30th, 31st, the last day of the month. November 1st comes along. They are now a holdover tenant and they have created a estate at sufferance because the person was there legally at one time and legally obtained the right of possession through the signing of a lease. But now they are illegally there because they went past the agreed upon time. That's the holdover that creates this fourth tenancy. And that's called at sufferance, meaning that the landlord or the owner is suffering because A, he doesn't have the possession, those uh, re reversionary rights did not come back, 
because the tenant didn't surrender them. He stayed in the property and the landlord is not collecting money for this. That's why it's called an estate at sufferance. So the actual lease agreement is a legal contract. So for parties to enter into a lease, they must have a couple different things, just like the contract required. Remember one of the things in the contract was that a person had to be of legal age and sufficient mental capacity. That is in the legal world is called the capacity to contract. That is when you put those together, a person must be of legal age and sufficient mental capacity. If they have both of those, then they have the ability or the capacity to enter into a contract. So all parties in that must have the ability. We owned a property management company and at one point we managed property for this family. It was actually a father and his two twin daughters who were seniors in high school and he got a job and had to move like 60 miles away. Well, he will allowed his two daughters to stay in a rental that we were managing to finish their senior year so they could graduate from that high school. They were 17 years old and did not have the capacity to contract. They weren't of legal age. Therefore, they could not sign the lease. The father had to sign the lease as the responsible party. Obviously, that contract has to be for a legal objective and rental of property is a legal objective. There has to be mutual ascension or sometimes you hear it called the meeting of the minds, meaning both parties agree. And that is done through the offer and the ex acceptance. There has to be some consideration. Now, wait, we're going to change the word contract a little bit, because in this scenario, remember, in general, a contract had to have consideration. And we joked about the marriage contract has love, honor, and cherish. That truly are the consideration. But real estate, remember, we deal at an arm's length, meaning I don't know the other party, Therefore, love, honor, and cherish had no value. And at that time, we said, what constituted consideration? We said money. And it was so important that in the deed, if you recall, there was a generic statement that said, for $10 and other good and valuable services. That consideration section was so important that it was a generic statement in the deed. However, in this contract, because of the reversionary interest, meaning the landlord is going to get the property back, now there could be other things of value besides money. In the general conveyance, boop, I am never going to see that house again. I don't care if you put a new roof on it because I'm never going to see it again, meaning it's not coming back to me. Well, in a lease, because it is a limited time frame, the landlord or the building owner or the property owner has reversionary rights, meaning it will come back to him. So actually now that new roof could be valuable to the lessor because of the fact it's coming back. So in leases, it is possible that there could be things other than rent that would count as consideration. Like the tenant says, if the tenant were to say, hey, I'll rent the property, and over the course of the first four months, I will put a new roof on it because I'm a roofer. And for that, I want the actual money amount of rent lowered. Instead of paying a thousand, I want to pay 750 
and I will put a roof on the property for you. That here is a case of something other than money can be counted as consideration because of the fact the property is going to go back to the original owner. So typically consideration is rent, but it could be other things. For example, I told you we rented or we owned a property management company. Well, we had a maintenance man that worked for us and he did the maintenance on all of the 60 houses. For that, we allowed him to rent one of those 60 houses at a reduced rate and paid him at a reduced rate and in essence swapped the compensation. His name was Terry and we said, hey Terry, you can live in one of these rentals and instead of it being 750, you're only going to pay $600 a month. And instead of us paying you X dollars an hour, we're going to pay you a different rate because we're going to swap those out. That is an example of labor and other services. There's another good example. A lot of times apartment complexes will allow police officers either a free unit or a reduced rate so that they, in essence, become the security officer of that apartment complex. You get what I'm saying? So if there's an issue in the security or in the apartment complex, instead of maybe calling the cops, they would call this security officer who actually was a police officer, and that was his quote-unquote part-time gig. And for that, he got reduced rates on the rental to be that person. So consideration can be more than just money because of the reversionary interests that the original landlord has. Now, like the uh, conveyance, you have to have some description of the property in there. And that's usually... In this world, we do use the street address, hey, 12 Smith Street. A good lease might have some basic legal description like lot four of Modulin Estates per plat book 41, but it's typically going to have it. The landlord is going to give possession, and in that possession is the implied quiet enjoyment. And I told you that we are giving quiet enjoyment to the less to the lessee. The tenant has the right to not have Sears come knocking at the door and try and take the party, property from them. In that, there's also some usual definition of when the landlord can enter the property. Hey, I'm going to give you a 24-hour notice. There are exceptions and they are called an emergency. And typically an emergency is defined as cries for help. If he's standing outside and he hears someone crying for help, he does not have to give notice. Fire, if there's a fire. Free flowing water, like, hey man, I hear the pipe burst. I'm not going to call you and let that water run. I'm going to go in. So, uh, and under the Uniform Landlord and Tenant Act, which I think we're getting ready to talk to here in a bit, it, um, it defines that. It, the lease will explain the use of the premises to be used as residential real estate. You cannot run a little dog grooming business out of the garage. Don't start a daycare, all of those issues. The lease is gonna talk about the term. Is it an estate for years? Does it have that defined beginning and defined end? Or is it more of a period to period? There typically can be charged a security deposit that is held by the landlord during the term of the lease. This security deposit is there to secure the fact that the tenant gives the property back at the end of the lease in virtually the same condition. Now the states do allow for what's called common wear and tear. So like the carpet, but typically, hey, it had a roof when you rented it, and it better have a roof when I come back to it. 
that security deposit can be applied to either repairs that the tenant made or if they skipped out on rent. And together, these two are called damages. And a landlord can seek damages from the tenant. And theoretically, the amount of money that was required for secure deposit is what's going to help offset these unpaid rents or repairs. <clears throat> now, a landlord could actually seek more money, and that is where we start getting into these small claims court cases where the landlord has said, hey, Your Honor, I'm holding $500 in damage, uh, security deposit, but the tenant caused $1,000 in damages, and we're not going to go through that proof and all that. Let's just say and the judge says yes. The landlord is now due 1000 He has 500 as the security. They could place a general lien against the tenant. That is the judgment that we talked about in a previous chapter where the court awards the landlord another $500 in this example. And that then becomes an equitable involuntary general lien, or we call it a judgment because it's placed by the judge against the tenant. All right. So that is how the security deposit work. Now, there are many states that have maximums on what you can charge. You can't tell somebody, OK, your lease is going to be eight hundred dollars a month, but security deposit is twenty thousand dollars. There are maximum as to what you can charge. And if you remember back in the fair housing chapter, we said it's illegal to charge more security deposit for someone that with a disability than someone without a disability. And the trick, it's not a trick, the word game that the Fair Housing Act says, says you can charge a second security deposit because you have to re, re uh, <clears throat> configure your property back to what it originally was. For instance, you had to add a uh, ramp on the front door. Well, that's to put it back, or in essence, take that ramp out, put the house back to the original condition, you may ha incur more costs than you normally would, so you could charge a second security deposit for that.